Hey everybody, uh, welcome back to another episode of Developing a Proper Worldview. Um, this is going to be episode number 27, and uh, as I've mentioned in all the previous videos, if you just happen to be catching this out of the blue, um, just randomly clicking on a video and watching it, um, I highly recommend that you go back and watch these in order. Um, there's a strategic um, logic behind doing these in order. I'm, I'm trying to build um, step by step. I'm trying to take you down the same path that I went down um, so that, that you can, because uh, then we can talk apples to apples. Like if you understand the same things that I'm understanding, you're seeing the same things that I'm seeing. Um, it just seems like there's there's more room for dialogue there. And I feel like it's not just important about what you know, but the order of how you know it. I feel like it's important to, um, it, well, first of all, you, you have to have the foundation of Jesus Christ. Like that, that, there's no other options. You must be born again, because this this entire scheme, this entire uh, geopolitical historical realm of existence, is is God's creation. This is His plan. All things are working according to His counsel, His purposes, and He's told us in His in His Bible what what is to come. Um, in general senses, we we don't get. Um, a lot of the specific details although he does give us specific details on some things but we get a general idea that this world is going to get worse and worse uh, that Christians will be persecuted and hated and hunted down and um, that the the entire world is going to come together in some sort of world system uh, where they're going to worship the devil worship the beast um, the entire world is going to be forced to take a mark of allegiance uh, that's going to be tied directly into the financial sector. Um, you won't be able to buy or sell without this mark. And that uh, taking the mark is aligning with Satan and you'll suffer the wrath of God. And during this period when this world system exists, the wrath of God um, or the judgments of God, um, better spoken, the judgments of God are going to be poured down on this kingdom, this, this, this world system, the new world order. And while that's occurring, um, Christians are, are going to face extreme persecution, um, but he who endures to the end um, will be saved. Um, we're called to persevere, um, to, to reach out to the lost, to proclaim the gospel, to not count our lives worthy of anything. It's okay if we die. We're going, you know, to, to die is gain, the scriptures say. So you have to have this biblical understanding, excuse me, before you can even start to branch out and try to understand what's going on in the world and why the world is moving in the direction that it's moving. Um, if you try to study this without a biblical foundation, without the, the Spirit of God guiding you, uh, you're going to come up with all sorts of ridiculous angles. Uh, you're going to end up blaming the wrong people. Uh, you're you're going to end up anti-Semitic or you're going to end up um, a revolutionary or you're going to end up believing in nonsensical um, extraterrestrial alien conspiracies. And so um, you have to understand things from a biblical perspective. Once you have that, once, once you can see things through the spiritual lens of the Holy Scriptures and through God's foreordained plan, then you can start to understand why the world is, why it's like it is, and, and why it's moving in the direction it's moving, and why our politi politicians speak the way they do, and why corporations act the way they do, and why the media proclaims what it does. And so we've been in the process of laying the second uh, layer on, onto that foundation of Jesus Christ, uh, which would be creationism, uh, destroying the theory of evolution that causes doubt in so many people, that causes so many people to look at the world incorrectly and to cast a shadow on the scriptures. It causes them to doubt the scriptures. The Bible says one thing and, and so-called science says another. Uh, people are, are tempted to believe these so-called experts and, and academia and, and knowledgeable folks. But we've, we've now gone through um, six of the seven Kent Hovind Creation Seminar Series videos, and we've shown that the theory of evolution is just ridiculous. It's pseudoscience, uh, what the Bible calls in Timothy, science falsely called so. It's not real science. It's trickery. It's a delusion. Um, it's deception. It's... it's um, picking and choosing their evidence and ignoring the real evidence and based on circular reasoning. So we've seen extensively that the real scientific evidence uh, points to a young earth, points to a, a worldwide flood at some point, um, which confirms the, the biblical history outlined in the pages of scripture. 
And so, uh, like I say, we, we've gotten through six of those videos, so we're on the last one, number seven, uh, which is actually pretty exciting for me because um, this is such a lengthy project that we've taken on here. It's, a, it's an endeavor that if the Lord tarries and gives us the time to do so, um, it's going to take us years to get through. And so it's really exciting to start to come to an end of this section here, these uh, Dr. Kent Hoven videos. And so we're on the last one. The last one's a three-hour video, so it's probably going to take us about three sessions to get through. Um, uh, but then we, we've got a few other evolutionary-based documentaries to look at, and then we'll be moving on. Um, so this one here is uh, question and answers. Um, so it should be very informative, uh, where Dr. Hoven's just going to uh, take on tough questions um, and, and provide us ammunition, uh, give us answers to use um, if we ever come across uh, atheists or evolutionists that want to bring these things up. So, um, without further ado, let's jump into it and uh, see what uh, uh, disc number seven has to offer us. All right, here we go. Welcome to our very informal question and answer session where we deal with questions that are not covered in our seminar on creation evolution. Uh, for those just getting this material, my name is Kent Hovind. I taught high school science for 15 years and now do seminars on creation and evolution since early 1989 I've been doing this. The Bible tells us in the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 7, he said, I applied my heart to know and to seek and to search and to seek out wisdom and the reason of things. First Peter, chapter 3, tells us that we should be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh us a reason of hope that's in us. I think it's good for Christians to study the truth so that they can give an answer to those that are not Christians. And it's good for those of you that are not Christians to study the truth so that you can become Christians. When you get to the top of the mountain of truth, you'll find the Christians were sitting there all along. Uh, God's word is truth. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, the Bible tells us we should study to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So, in this session, we're going to deal with quite a few miscellaneous questions. If you have questions that are not covered here or elsewhere in the seminar, feel free to send them in. We'll try to deal with them as time permits on our website, drdino.com, or on our radio program, or possibly in a future edition of our question answer tapes. One question I often get when I say I believe in creation, they're going to say, well, wait a minute, all scientists believe in evolution. Well, that's simply not true, okay? The vast majority of scientists may believe, or some the majority of scientists may believe in evolution, but it depends on what you mean by evolution. But all scientists do not believe in evolution. And even if they did, that's not how you determine truth. It is possible for the majority to be wrong. History shows us there are many times when the majority is wrong. The majority of scientists used to teach that all the planets go around the Earth. That is wrong, as far as we know. By the way, there's still some folks who believe in the geocentric theory. I don't fight them. I disagree with them. But uh, there are really some surprising number of folks who believe in the geocentric theory. But for years, many people thought, the majority of people thought, that the heavy objects fall faster than lighter objects. That was taught for 2,000 years, and it's wrong. It's not true. For many years, it was taught, if you're sick, you have bad blood. Take out your blood, and you'll get better. That is simply wrong. It's not true. There were places all over the country to get your blood taken out. They had little white poles out front with a red stripe around it. The barber was the blood letter. So even if a majority of scientists do believe something, that doesn't make it true. Let me give you an example here from the book of John, chapter 7. The people, therefore, were, they were arguing about Christ, and they said, when they heard this saying, said, of a truth, this is the prophet. Others said, this is the Christ. But some said, shall Christ come out of Galilee? Hath not the scripture said that Christ cometh of the seed of David, out of the town of Bethlehem, where David was? Here's a Hovind translation. They're arguing about the wrong subject. They were arguing, should Christ come out of Bethlehem or Galilee? And they thought Jesus came from Galilee, so he can't be the Christ. They didn't realize he came from Bethlehem. So he, he was the Christ, obviously. He did come from Bethlehem, but he was raised in Galilee. In John chapter 7, it says there was a division among the people because of him, and some of them would have taken him, but no man laid hold on him. What I get from this verse is, if you don't like somebody, if you don't like their message, kill the messenger. Mm. And this you see a lot in the creation-evolution uh, arguments. If you watch some of my debates, I've had over 80 debates now at universities. Oftentimes, they get so angry at me because of what I'm saying. Uh, I'm just delivering a message. I'm just telling you what the truth is from science and what God's Word says. Don't get angry at me. There are folks, there are over 500 anti hovind websites. They really don't like me. And they all want to get me into an email debate. And then they say, I won't debate them. I won't an email debate them, but I'll debate them publicly anytime, anywhere. Um, I don't have time for an email debate. I'll type 12 words a minute with 19 mistakes. I simply don't have time, okay? And we have to run a real busy ship around here. The next verse says, 
Then came the officers to the chief priests and Pharisees, and they said unto him, Why have you not brought him? Now get the picture here. The Pharisees sent their office, sent the officers off to catch to get Jesus. And then they came back without him, and they said, Why didn't you get him? And the officers said, Never man spake like this man. Here's the Hoban translation. The professors sent their students off to ask the heretic questions, but they didn't, the professors didn't go themselves. I get this a lot. I'll speak at universities. The professor doesn't show up uh, to, answer, to ask questions, but he sends his students with a list of questions. And you see the student pull out a list of questions, and they're going to trip up Hoban on something, you know, so they ask me their question, and I answer all of them. And then they go back and tell their professor, well, he answered all my questions. And the professor says, well, you should have asked him this and this and this. Well, you coward, you should have come yourself, professor. Don't send your students off to do your dirty work. If you got a question, give me a call. What I also get from this verse is the Pharisees decided they're going to use the law. They're going to legally try to stop this guy. from. There's a good point to be made there. Um, you know, we're supposed to leave off of a conversation when we perceive um, in a person that they don't have knowledge. It's a terrible paraphrase of that proverb, but um, leave off a fool when you perceive in him not the lips of knowledge or something like that. But um, he mentioned how um, the professors will send students with questions, and then uh, when he answers the questions and they go back to the professor, they'll say, well, you should ask this and this and this. That just shows that the professor had no interest in learning the answer to those questions. It was just for skepticism and for doubt. So when you encounter somebody like that, when, when, when you're sharing the gospel with somebody and you can discern that they're just being scoffers, they're there because a lot of times people scoff by asking questions and you can discern they're not sincere. There's, there's no, I can debate and debate and debate and overcome objection after objection after objection. They're just going to keep coming up with more objections because they have no interest in learning the truth. They just want to argue. And so uh, wisdom says, you know, I'm not going to continue to argue with this person. They, they, there's no, there's not going to be any fruit out of it. Uh, so, you know, you, you've presented the gospel and they want to argue in a point and, and, and their arguments are not based on any sincerity. It's just an argumentative scoffing. Um, so just leave that off. Don't wear yourself out against it. Sharing this message. They wanted to shut Jesus up. And there are people who would use legal tactics to try to shut up the Christians. They try to exclude Christianity from public schools. They can't handle the message, so they shut down the message so people don't get a chance to hear it. And that's what I see in John chapter uh, 7. Then answered them, the Pharisees, are ye also deceived? The Pharisees are saying, are you stupid? Then they said, have any of the rulers of the Pharisees believed on him? Notice this. Their evidence that Jesus could not be the Messiah was because they didn't believe he was the Messiah. Therefore, he can't be because we don't believe he is. You get the same kind of logic with some of these professors in colleges. They'll say, well, all scientists believe in evolution, therefore it must be true. <laughs> That's ridiculous, okay? They don't all believe in it, and even if they did, that doesn't make it true. You can see the same parallel 2,000 years ago in the book of John. Then the Pharisees said, this people who know not the law are cursed. Here's the Hoban translation of this verse. We have knowledge you don't. We don't approve your degree. You're ignorant if you don't believe in evolution. And you'll see this a lot in the creation-evolution argument. They'll say, we're smart, everybody else is dumb. I get this a lot when I do debates. They'll say, well, the average person in the audience probably doesn't understand the complexity of this topic. And I'll say, folks, what he's trying to tell you is, you're dumb, he's smart. And that's precisely what they're trying to, trying to say in a subtle way. Mm -hmm. The next verse, verse 50 says, Nicodemus saith unto them, he that came to Jesus by night, doth our law judge any man before it hear him, and know what he doeth? They answered and said unto him, Art thou also of Galilee? Search and look, for out of Galilee ariseth no prophet. And every man went to his own house. Even some of the non-believers were smart enough to realize this guy is telling the truth. And we get people by the thousands that write our ministry or call us and say, look, I was not a believer, but I saw your material on creation, and I'm convinced creation is true. And that's what we're trying to do. We want to convince you that God's word is true. The whole argument here in John 7 started with a false assumption that Jesus came out of Galilee. Okay, They're arguing about the wrong topic. The Pharisees didn't believe in him, so they said that's proof he can't be the Christ because we don't believe him. If he was, we wouldn't believe in him. That's silly. That's the same thing you used to get today. Skeptics will say, well, has Hovind or any of these, have any of these creations published in science journals? And when they say no, they'll say, see, that proves, that proves he can't be right. <laughs> That's their logic, okay? It doesn't take a few seconds to think how dumb that is. 
first place, creationist material is routinely excluded from creation, from science journals, because, from, I should say, science journals, because they started with the definition that science cannot include the supernatural. Therefore, if your explanation isn't 100% natural, it's not science. Therefore, creation is by definition not science. That's their thinking. They don't realize evolution is not science. Evolution is based purely on the assumption that things happen. It's never observed or tested or demonstrated in the laboratory. It's purely religious. The majority can often be wrong. The majority followed Aaron in rebellion in Exodus chapter 32. The majority voted not to go into the promised land in Numbers chapter 32. The majority followed false gods many times throughout the Old Testament. Read through it and you'll see the majority was wrong. The majority of religious leaders hated Jesus. The majority of the world hates Christians. So. It is not true that all Christians, all scientists believe in evolution. If it were, it wouldn't matter, okay? And you don't determine truth that way. But let me share with you a few Christians who are scientists, who are strong believers in creation, and who are also very brilliant scientists. Robert Gentry, a friend of mine from uh, Tennessee, is a brilliant scientist when it comes to radioactive material and the disposal of radioactive waste. He worked at Oak Ridge Laboratories. He published this book here, Creation's Tiny Mysteries. Excellent book about radiopolonium halos. You can get it through our ministry in our bookstore on our website. Robert Gentry was doing tremendous work. It was published in many major science journals about radio polonium halos being found in granites all over the world. I went and met with Robert Gentry, saw, his, saw the polonium halos through the microscope in his laboratory, and everybody was fine until they realized, wow, his research proves the Big Bang Theory is not true. And boy, they shut off his funding and his grant money in a hurry. He uh, finally uh, said, well, we don't, we don't have a job for you anymore just because his research was supporting creation. Dr. Robert Gentry up in uh, Halo, and go to www.halos.com and see for yourself. Dr. Uh, I'm sorry, Roger DeHart was a science teacher in uh, near Seattle, Washington. He was told he could not inform his students of errors in the textbooks. Here they've got textbooks with mistakes in them, but he couldn't tell his students about the mistakes because if they, those mistakes were used to support the evolution theory. He said, they said you can't even pass out current science journals to inform students of mistakes in the textbooks. That's not science. That said, uh, you know, burn the heretic attitude that some people get, or go burn the witch. You know, there's a talk about a witch hunt. Think about how wicked that is. The guy doesn't even mention creationism. Just says, hey, I found some mistakes in the textbooks. And they say, nah, you can't point those out to the students. What do you mean? And he's even going to use science journals to contradict what's in the textbooks. To say, look, this what's in the textbook is wrong. Imagine, you know, if, if that was done in any other subject, if, if history said that uh, uh, you got a history book that says Hitler won World War II, and your teacher goes, well, that's a mistake, let's take it out. And they go, nah, nah, you can't take that out. Uh, and don't tell your students it's a mistake. Well, then you're intentionally lying to the students that's you're in, you're intentionally misleading them um that's wicked and it's against the law as he pointed out in one of his earlier videos uh by law most states i think uh most states um if not most a lot of the states um have statutes that say uh textbooks must be factual um any errors in them are it's against the law to have known errors so it's 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 just complete manipulation, deception, and brainwashing. Uh, the evolutionists are on a witch hunt against the creationists in the public schools. They will try desperately to get them fired from their job. Kevin Haley was a biology teacher at Central Oregon Community College in Bend, Oregon. He lost his job simply because he was exposing errors in the textbooks. He'd say, kids, information on page 87 has been proven wrong. Disregard that. That won't be on the test. And he's right. It was proven wrong. I debated one professor one time, and I gave out like 20 or 30 lies in the textbooks, and he got up and said, now folks, Hovind's right, all these things are not true, but, he said, Hovind, I got a question, what are you going to replace all this with? In other words, we can't take the lies out of the books until I find a replacement. In other words, I've got to provide evidence for his theory, or else we can't take the lies out of the books. Talk about dumb. Uh, that's not the way science works, okay? You teach the kids the truth, just teach the truth, okay? And if all you have are lies to back up your theory, then get a new theory. In uh, Texas, Baylor University fired William Dembski just because he advocated that there might be an intelligent designer. Oh, that's heresy. There could be a designer. You're out of here. You're fired. Forrest Mims was a science writer for 20 years. He published in National Geographic, Science Digest, American Journal of Physics, over 60 magazines and newspapers. He was denied a job as science writer for Scientific American simply because he was a creationist. 
They didn't want to have a creationist on their staff. Teacher Ronald Levesque was told he could not uh, share information that might help students doubt Darwin's theory. See, Darwin's theory is sacred. You don't question it without losing your job in many school systems. Okay? The same thing happened in Russia 10, 15 years ago. If a teacher got up in their class and said, kids, I don't believe communism works, he'd be out of a job and maybe out of the country or out of this life. They'd kill him or send him off to Siberia. You get the same kind of academic Siberia. People send off academic Siberia if they don't support the evolution theory right here in America, the land of the free and the home of the slave. Mr. Uh, Eller told his teacher, Dan Clark, in Lafayette, Indiana, Mr. Eller was the uh, superintendent, that he could not introduce creationism to his class. So uh, Dan Clark resigned. He quit. Many good teachers are dropping out of the public school system because they're not allowed to teach kids the truth. The problem is not the law. The law says you can teach creation. Not a problem to teach creation legally. The courts have ruled it's okay to teach creation, but the boss says don't do it. The ACLU, which is the American Communist Lawyers Union, they learned years ago all they have to do is threaten to sue and the school will back down. Even though the ACLU knows they will lose the suit, doesn't matter, the threat of a suit is enough to make it the, teacher, the teachers get fired. Just the threat of a suit. And so that's what's happening. We're losing by default and not even putting up a good fight. Dean Kenyon was a professor at uh, San Francisco State University in San Francisco. He wrote uh, many books about evolution. He was the poster boy for the evolutionist. He was a strong believer in theory. And one day he got converted and began to believe in creation. And they fired him. He sued. They put him back in as a lab assistant, you know, washing test tubes, which the students do normally. And here's a guy, 20 year, I believe, tenured professor. Finally, after a long battle, he was reinstated with his job. But if he hadn't been tenured, he wouldn't have kept his job. That's what happened to Dean Kenyon. He wrote the book of Pandas and People, which you can get through our ministry. But Dr. Denny at the Texas Tech University had on his website for years that if you wanted to get recommended for medical school, is from Lubbock, Texas, that you had to confess to believing in evolution. If you don't believe in evolution, you, he's not going to recommend you for medical school. When I spoke in Lubbock, Texas in the fall of 2002, the students there got together and offered Denny $900 if he would debate me. He refused. He wouldn't debate for two hours for 900 bucks. I don't know how much it makes an hour, but I suspect it's not quite that much. So, Mr. Denny, I'll come anytime, anywhere, and take you on intellectually in a debate on creation and evolution. Evolution is one of the dumbest ideas in the history of humanity, and the devil is laughing at you for believing in that silly theory. And it's, if you don't trust Christ, you're going to go to hell. I'm not your enemy, I'm your friend. I don't want to see you go to hell. I'd like to see you get converted. But what you're doing is unfair and certainly unwise, and I think un-American. To require a student to believe a certain religion, and all you have is a religious worldview of evolution, and you require students to believe that before you give them a recommendation letter. Come on, grow up, let kids learn the truth. We can go on and on how people are discriminated against by, because of their belief in creation. Uh, Patrick Henry College was notified they were going to deny their uh, recommendation uh, to be accredited simply because they didn't believe in evolution. We'll have lots of information on our website about how students or universities or teachers are discriminated against because of their belief in creation. Now, it wasn't always this way. If you go back in the past, 100 years ago, 200 years ago, all the scientists believed in creation. Here's a list of quite a few scientists, Francis Bacon, Johann Kepler, uh, Blaise Pascal, Robert Boyle, uh, Isaac Newton. These guys were the founders of major branches of science, Carol Linnaeus, and they were creationists. George Cuvier, um, on and on the list goes of hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands, of very famous scientists who were creationists. Mm. Not always young earth creationists, but certainly creationists. And many were young earth creationists. Uh, Richard Owen, Louis Agassi, um, James Jewell. All you got to do is kill those folks. The many, nearly all branches of science are started by people who believe in creation, not people who believe in evolution. The evolutionists don't come up with anything. They don't create anything. They come in and take over an institution that's already going. And many Christian colleges have been taken over by evolutionists. Harvard, Princeton, Yale started off as Christian schools. And now they've been taken over by those who believe in evolution. The evolutionists don't go start something, they just take over like a leech, you know, or a tick, or a parasite, what somebody else has already created. Uh, Werner von Braun, a space scientist, was a strong believer in creation. Um, there are many books out. There's a good book, In Six Days. 50, why 50 scientists chose to believe in creation? There are quite a few books on this topic. You can see our website, drdino.com, get more. Okay, next question. What about separation of church and state? Is it okay to discuss creation in public schools? Well, first place, the phrase separation of church and state is not found in the Constitution. Don't let somebody tell you that the law says it's to be separation of church and state. That's baloney. 
That, that phrase, phrase was used by Thomas Jefferson in a letter that he wrote to some pastors in the Danbury Association, the Baptist Association in Connecticut. He's the one that said, the First Amendment has erected a wall of separation between church and state. Thomas Jefferson said that. It's not in the Constitution. And by the way, if there's a wall between the two, it's a one-dimensional wall. It keeps the government out of the church. It, does not, it was not designed to keep the church out of the government. So there's no such thing as separation of church and state found in the Constitution. The fact of the matter is the Founding Fathers, when they gave the First Amendment, Article 1, same day, I believe, voted to give, I think, seven or ten or fifteen thousand dollars or something to a mission in uh, St. Louis to help some a Catholic mission reach the Indians there with what they thought was the gospel. Um, so just go through the history. Go to wallbuilders.com, David Barton's excellent website, and get some of his material, and you can see how that the Founding Fathers were certainly strong believers in creation and had no intention of the government getting involved in the church, but they had every intention of the church getting involved in the government. And the idea of no Christianity in public schools would have been an anathema to the Founding Fathers. They would have sent those guys off on a ship to some other country. Okay, next question. So, first of all, there shouldn't be government-sponsored schools. To have a, a public, a government-funded public school is, is wrong. And then also, the Constitution was set up because these people had fled from... Um, state-sponsored churches in, in Europe, like the Church of England, the Church of Norway, and so on and so forth, where you were mandated by the government to be a particular religion or a particular denomination. That's what the amendment was set up for, what the, what the Constitution was set up for, to stop state-sponsored religion. The government cannot force you to worship um, God or partake in any particular denomination. It, it nowhere mentions keeping your faith out of government service. Like, so that's a lie that's been just spread everywhere. And, and it, you hear about separation of church and state all the time, and it's not constitutional. So that right there should tell you, wait a minute, why are we being deceived all the time? Why do people just go along with this nonsense? You know, it's, 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 if something's repeated enough, people just buy into it, you know? They hear it on the media over and over again. They don't even stop to question it and go, hold up, that's not accurate. How do we see stars, stars that are billions of light years away? I get this question every seminar I do, I believe. There's no question there's an awful lot of stars out there. The Bible says in Nehemiah chapter 9, Thou, even Thou art Lord alone, Thou hast made the heaven and the heaven of heavens. God created all the stars, and there's an awful lot of stars out there. It's interesting, stars blow up every once in a while. They run out of fuel or whatever happens, and they implode and then explode. It's called a nova, or if it's a big one, it's called a supernova. It seems that about every 30 years, a star explodes. Well, after searching the heavens, they've only found 300 supernova rings. So the question would be, if the universe is millions of years old, why aren't there more supernova rings? The remnants of these blown up stars. 300 times 30 is 6,000 years. 6, years. Of course, the Bible says God made everything 6,000 years ago. And the textbooks say billions of years old. I think the textbooks have a problem because there should be a lot more supernova rings. Plus, obviously, you have a problem. Stars being born should equal stars dying or else you're going to have a real serious problem. There are plenty of stars out there, but we've never seen one star forming. We see stars blow up every 25 or 30 years. We've never proven the formation of one new star. One atheist I debated said, oh, there's a new star forming right now in Crab Nebula and some of the different uh, clouds out there in space. You see stars forming. No, you don't. You see spots getting brighter. You are assuming a star is forming, but actually all you're seeing is a spot getting brighter. It could be there's a dust cloud clearing and there was already a star behind it. Any fourth grader would know that. So nobody's ever proven the formation of one star. Uh, in Science Magazine in 86, they said, the silent embarrassment of modern astrophysics is that we do not know how even a single one of these stars managed to form. The situation's no better now. There, nobody can prove any star formed by natural processes. If dust tries to get together, as it increases in density, it increases the temperature, which increases the movement, and it drives it back away. It's called Boyle's gas laws. You cannot compress dust into um, solid matter without creating a real serious physical science problem of overcoming the gas laws. The pressure increases, the temperature increases, which drives them out again. It's not going to happen. One professor said, oh, well, we figured if 20 stars explode near each other, they'll produce enough energy to squeeze the gas and make a new star. I said, well, sir, that's just brilliant. You know, you're saying if you lose 20, you can gain one. 
Man, you, you ought to run, run for Congress, Congress and help those guys borrow their way out of the debt. debt. <laughs> That's, That's a dumb idea. idea. We've, We've never seen it happen. It's really theoretical. 20 stars can do that. But that is a losing proposition, not game. There are lots of stars. The Bible says God created the stars in Genesis 1.16. He created them to be lights on the earth. Psalm 147 says he counts the number of the stars and gives names to all of them. The Bible says he layeth the beam of his, beams of his chambers in the waters. Who make the clouds his chariot who walk upon the wings of the wind. It is possible that Psalm 104 ties in with Psalm 148, that there is still water above the heavens. Nobody knows what's beyond our, the stars, if there's a at all. But it could be that this verse and the verse of Revelation where the Lord sits on many waters is talking about the fact that there, is a, there was a layer of water above the earth and there may be another layer of water beyond the stars. Don't know, just a theory, something to chew on. There's no way we can tell anyway. Okay. There's a lot of stars out there. It's been estimated that everybody on Earth could own two, two trillion... What if there's water between us and the stars? Like, I've thought that too, like... What does light... How does light react in water? Like, if there's a layer of water somewhere up there between us and where the stars are, would that affect... Because it's, it's a perplexing question, um, and there are answers. Um... Uh, I, I read some articles on answers in Genesis about this topic. Like, um, if stars are really billions of light years away and the Earth is only 6,000 years old, how can we see their light? Wouldn't it take billions of years for that light to get here? Well, that's presuming a starting point. It's presuming that the light started coming from where the star is now. The scriptures say that God stretched the heavens out. So, like, it's very possible that the stars were a lot closer to Earth and then he stretched out the heavens. So the light that we see now carried with, like a, like a, like taking a ball of yarn and grabbing one end and tossing it. You know, that line goes all the way, so you've got a continual... So light would continually be here and, and we wouldn't lose anything. And then there's also the, the fact that light doesn't... The light, the speed of light is not constant. Um, it, it's affected by like magnetism, magnetism and uh, gravity and, and possibly water, I would think. I don't know. I'm not a scientist, but um, so there's there's answers out there and he's going to probably get into some as well. But um, it's just an interesting thing to think about. But don't let seemingly inconquerable, immovable questions like that confuse you or cause doubt. There's always an answer. The scriptures are true. Set that as your foundation. So no matter what argument comes against it, you know the Bible is true. You know the earth is only about 6,500 years old. You know that as a fact. That's what God has said in his word. So no matter what evidence people have, there must be something missing. They must have missing facts. Or they're misinterpreting the information. There's some other reasonable explanation. And there's like it's every theory... Every explanation that uh, it, it all fits the biblical narrative. Um, evolutionists choose the ones that don't fit, and, and, but even those, they're, they're using illogical reasoning. Like he talked about carbon dating, how you have to assume three things that are never true uh, with uh, daughter atoms and, and parent atoms and uh, uh, rate of decay and things like that. Um, so, uh, but it's just an interesting thing to, if, if you're really into science, go to Answers in Genesis, AIG.org, I think, and look up uh, Starlight articles. There's a ton on there, but it, it was way too scientific for me. They were talking way above my head. Stars to yourself. That's a lot. Million, billion, trillion. The stars are really far away. Hubble telescope focused in on a dot. They thought they found a black spot in space about the size of a grain of sand held at arm's length. They looked at that spot for 10 days. And in that one spot, there were so many stars they'd never seen before that they couldn't even count them. That's just one spot the size of a grain of sand, new stars just discovered. There's a lot of stars. Stephen Hawking, who, hate, who hates Christians and creationists, said, and won't debate me, by the way, Steve, I'll take on any time. Um, he said, stars are so far away, they appear to us to be just pinpoints of light. He said, there's only one feature we can observe, that is the color of their light. So when you look at a star, you cannot see the size or shape of the star. All you see is what color it is. We assume that stars are like the sun, and the sun is like stars, but that is purely an assumption. We don't know that. Hmm. Some people say, oh, yeah, we can tell by the elements that it's burning. It same gives a color characteristic, you know, the signature, you can tell the elements. You know, evolutionists never talk about this, but they are, of course, assuming 
that even the molecules evolved in other places, just like they evolved on Earth. They're assuming the same 92 elements we have here would be the same found throughout the universe. They never talk about that, but you have a real serious problem if you just assume that the same molecular arrangement evolved, because molecules would have to evolve too by your theory, which I think is a dumb idea. Okay. I taught high school trig for many years, is one of the uh, subjects I taught. If you want to find the distance to an object you can't possibly touch, like a star, you have to measure it with what's called parallax trigonometry. You have to know two sides and one angle, or two angles and one side, in order to calculate the distance to this unknown point, or to this, this unknown distance to this point, with simple sine, cosine, tangent. The problem is, Earth is only 8,000 miles in diameter, which is basically nothing compared to star distance. So to, to find the distance to a star, you have to get your observers further apart to make a triangle that's you know a decent angle. Well, they look at the star in January, then they look at the star in June, and they get a much bigger base on their triangle. This is Earth's orbit around the sun. Well, it's 93 million miles to the sun, which is a long ways, but it takes light eight minutes to get here from the sun. It's called one astronomical unit. That is, uh, the distance from the sun to the Earth is an AU, an astronomical unit. So we are eight light minutes from the sun, which means the diameter of our orbit is 16 light minutes. That would be the diameter of Earth's orbit around the sun. This diagram here shows a little yellow dot on the far left. That would represent Earth's orbit, 16 light minutes. A year has 525,000 minutes in it. That's a real skinny triangle if you did it to scale. It's like having two surveyors with you know, a telescope 16 inches apart, looking at a dot 525,000 inches away, which is eight and a third miles. Mm. You set that up and draw it out on a piece of graph paper, you find you got a real skinny triangle. It works out to be an angle of 0 0.017 degrees at the apex. I think you can have a hard time measuring something like that. If you want to measure 100 light years, by the way, that was just to measure one light year. If you wanted to measure 100 light years, you'd have to move your dot 830 miles away, keeping your surveyors 16 inches apart. That's like having two guys on my roof here in Pensacola, Florida, looking at a dot in Chicago. If the guys are 16 inches apart and they're focusing on a dot in Chicago, that's a real skinny triangle, okay? Figuring 15 billion light years is clearly impossible. It just can't be done. And mm -hmm. I don't think you can tell exactly where you were six months ago on opposite sides of Earth's orbit. That would be a stretch also. Okay. This textbook says, parallax trigonometry can be used to measure distances less than 100 light years. It's very intriguing. So, uh, like, a lot of this is just guesswork. Like, they, they can't measure distances that big. So they're just guessing. It's all less than 100 light years. Which, I don't think, there's no stars less than 100 light years, are there? So they can't really tell the distance of any stars. The stars could be 3,000 light years away or whatever. They would, there'd be no way of knowing. I agree. Much less. I think you'd have a hard time measuring 20 light years, but I'll give them 100. I'll give them 500 for the sake of the argument. The fact is you can't measure a billion. I'm not saying the stars aren't that far away. They, they probably are. I'm just pointing out we have no way of measuring it. We don't know how far away they are. If somebody tells you that star is, you know, 7.9 billion light years away, just say, how did you measure it? Was it a Stanley, a Lefkin, or a Craftsman? Who held the other end of that tape measure? Because I want to meet this guy. It just can't be done. So number one, you cannot measure the distance to the stars. Number two, we don't know what light is. Is it a wave? Is it a photon? Is it a particle? Is, I mean, it behaves sometimes like waves, sometimes like energy. It, it, nobody knows for sure what light is. We know what it does, and we use it all the time, obviously, but nobody's ever defined what light is very clearly. That's crazy. So the entire principle or concept behind it. Especially when, when God compares himself and his word to light so often, he dwells in unapproachable light. Jesus called himself the light of the world. The, the Bible's called a lamp under my feet, a light for my path. And, and light is mysterious. It's like, what is it? You know? Very, very intriguing. Black hole is the idea that light can be attracted by gravity. Well, if light can be attracted by gravity, if black holes exist, which nobody's proven that either, but then the speed of light can't be a constant. At Harvard University in 99, they slowed light down to 38 miles an hour. The next year, they slowed it down to one mile an hour. That's crazy. In the year 2000. The next year, they brought it to a dead stop. 
They took light and absolutely stopped it. This was done at Harvard, it was done at Smithsonian, and it was done at Cambridge. And by the way, that's how science works. An experiment should be demonstrable, repeatable, testable. Evolution is none of those. Nobody's ever demonstrated or tested they or proven any of them. How? It's all in the mind. They think it happened. It's not science. Okay. At Princeton University in the year 2000, hmm. they speeded light up to 300 times the speed of light. That's Why crazy. would the speed of light be an unbreakable barrier? Uh, Barry Setterfield, Australian astronomer, did a lot of work on the, the speed of light question. He says the speed of light has decreased. He said in the last 300 years, at least 164 measurements of the speed of light have been published, 16 different ways it was measured. He said the speed of light has apparently decreased so rapidly that experimental error cannot explain it. Here's a chart showing that the speed of light has declined in the last 150 years. At about 1960, the chart seems to level off, and everybody since about 1960 has gotten the same number. If you measure the speed of light today, you're probably going to get 186,282 point something miles per second. Okay. That could be because in the late 50s and early 60s, they began using the atomic clock to measure the speed of light. And the atomic clock uses the wavelength of a cesium-133 atom, which means you're using light to measure light. You have a rubber ruler. Of course, you're not going to see it if it's declining. It may be we're on the tail end of a logarithmic, logarithmic digression, or it simply may be we're using a rubber ruler by using this atomic clock to measure. There's a couple articles showing about how that the speed of light was apparently exceeded by a factor of as much as 100. Clear back in 88 and 95, there were articles published about this. The speed of light is not a constant. Um, the Radio Physical Research Institute in Russia, uh, the cosmologist there, said the speed of light was 10 billion times faster at time zero. Astrophysics and Space Science Magazine, 1987. According to the Big Bang Theory, the speed of light had to be much faster initially. Here's an article from 2001, uh, Science News, saying about the speed of light may have changed over history, study says. Um, Imperial College in London, the man wrote an article and said, a shocking possibility is that the speed of light might change in time during the life of the universe. At uh, Rutgers uh, New Service put out an article from Sydney about a team from Australia that said the speed of light may not be a constant in August of 2002. It says the speed of light can change. The speed limit of the cosmos is being questioned. September 2002. So there's a book out called Faster Than the Speed of Light. And I'm sure this fellow who wrote this book was persecuted for daring to suggest such heresy as this. Discover Magazine uh, ran an article about this. Was Einstein wrong about the speed of light? A recent article saying Einstein was wrong. The speed of light is not a constant. So I don't think we can prove what light is, and I don't think we can prove lights always travel the same speed. Number three, the creation was finished when God made it. It's interesting, Jesus made wine out of grapes that never existed. Turned water straight to wine. Where's the grape stage? He can make a full-grown man out of the dirt and then make a woman out of his rib and make animals out of the dirt. He can make the earth out of nothing. Jesus made enough to feed 5,000 people out of a little boy sack lunch. We're always trying to limit God. I get real worried about folks that try to put human limitations on God. Uh, God didn't make two babies and put them in the Garden of Eden and hand them a package of seeds and say, here, plant these quick. You're going to need supper. He made a full-grown man and a full-grown woman in a full-grown garden. That's the only way it's going to work. Number four, thing to consider. A light year is a distance. It's not a time. It's a distance. It's the distance light can travel in a year at today's speed. A light year could be done in one second if you speed the light up. It's simply a distance. It's like so many gazillion miles. I think a six trillion miles is a light year. Okay, number five. Since the speed of light is not proven to be consistent, why would star distance have anything to do with age of the universe? Some people say, oh, wait a minute now. I know we can't measure the distance with... Uh, triangulation, parallax trigonometry. What about measuring with Cephic variables or redshift? That's the other way they try to do it, and also loaded with flaws in the theory there. The redshift is the idea that when light goes uh, from a star, the red is shifted over. They look at the light through a spectroscope, and you'll see black lines on there, and the black lines are shifted toward the red end of the spectrum. You get the normal spectrum, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, but the black lines are shifted red. And they'll say, wow, this is proof the star is receding. It's running, it's moving away from us. That could be, I don't know. But there might be other ways to answer this. This is called the Doppler effect. If a train is coming toward you, it squeezes the sound waves in as the train makes noise, and you hear it, it drops pitch as it goes past you. It's called the Doppler effect. 
if you're going past the sound source or the sound source is going past you. Either way, it works the same. Sound is it's called compressed coming in and refracted or stretched going out. Well, they thought possibly if the star is coming in, it would squeeze the light waves, whatever light waves are, and make a blue shift. If the star is leaving, it would make a red shift. And so when the red shift was discovered years ago, they looked around the heavens and found most of the stars are giving a red shift. And they said, wow, this proves they're leaving. No, it doesn't, but that was the assumption. And then they said, if all the stars are moving away, that proves there was a Big Bang. That was the evidence for the Big Bang theory, the red shift. Talk about a lack of logic, but uh, that's what they said. OK. This fellow says there was an early sign that red shifts reliably indicate the distance of galaxies. For quasars, however, the diagram shows a wide scatter in apparent brightness at every redshift. He said, in fact, there is little correlation of brightness to redshift at all. Either quasars come in an extremely wide range of intrinsic luminosities, as most people believe, or the redshifts do not indicate distance. Sky and Telescope, December 94. Um, same magazine said, uh, thus, for the only conclusion that can be drawn is that at least some quasars are relatively nearby. And a large fraction of their redshift is due to something other than expansion of the universe. So somebody tells you we know the distance to stars because of redshift, say, I'm sorry, that is simply not correct. We don't know the distance because of redshift. Get the book, The Evolution Cruncher, from our ministry. It's $5 for a 900-page book, excellent book, loaded with stuff on creation evolution. He's got a whole section about the Doppler effect and the expanding universe. Science News 95 said, another set of observations indicates that the universe appears to be 8.4 to 10.6 billion years old. The new work relied on the Hubble Space Telescope to obtain, obtain distance to faraway galaxies. A team led by Tanberg University of England used a two-step method to estimate the Hubble constant. I always get a kick out of that. Here they've got an equation which involves a number that you're going to multiply, like an algebraic equation, and they can change that number. They call it a constant, but they change it all the time. Okay. I taught algebra for years. I'm telling you, you change one letter in an equation or one value in an equation, you change the outcome. That's why they're always getting wild numbers for the age of the universe, because the Hubble constant is not a constant at all. OK, let's go on here. He said, first they observed a type of standard candle, stars on a set of variables, to find the distance to the spiral galaxy M96. He said, you have to be very careful about drawing conclusions because of the Hubble constant, because measurements have huge systematic errors. Astronomers believe the veil, one of the best studied supernova remnants, was 2,500 years, light years away and 18,000 years old. They were quite wrong. In fact, the veil was only 1,500 light years away and 5,000 years old, from Discover Magazine, January of 2001. An article about Rip Van Winkle showing stars are much younger than they thought. Um, the article, University Around Us at Cambridge University, said even the nearest Cephids are so remote, it's difficult to determine their absolute distance with any accuracy, any great accuracy. All large distances in astronomical literature are subject to an error of perhaps 10% from this cause alone. He said, we know that faintness, and how bright the star is, arises from two causes, distance and absorbing matter in space, and it's generally not possible to apportion it between the two. Get the book, The Evolution Cruncher, and find out what happened to Halt and Hart, who dared to question the redshift theory. Good way to lose your job. There's discrimination against those because they're looking for, looking for anything to hang on to some Big Bang theory is the problem. Big Bang theory is a dud. Fred Hoyle said that 30 years ago, or 20 years ago. OK, Isaiah 40 tells us the Lord sits on the circle of the earth, and it says he stretched out the heavens like a curtain. Isaiah 42 talks about the stretching of the heavens. Isaiah 45 says he stretched out the heavens. Jeremiah 10 says he stretched out the heavens. There are several theories of what's causing the red shift. One theory is the stretching from the creation. This is a normal thing you would expect because he stretched out the heavens like a curtain, just like the Bible told us. Maybe that's the only reason we have a red shift. Second theory is the light's getting tired, traveling great distance. Third theory is as it travels through whatever space is made up, maybe space is nothing, maybe space is something. We don't know what space is. But as the light travels, that may automatically be a phenomenon that causes the red shift. It could be the Doppler effect. The star could be moving away. I don't know, and nobody knows. Okay? It could be the light is being speeded up or slowed down as it goes past a dense gravitational mass in space. We simply don't know what's causing the red shift. Next question, I get asked this question quite frequently, actually, is the sun shrinking? The sun is obviously burning. You can step outside and look at it in the daytime. The sun is losing about 5 million tons of mass every second. The sun is obviously burning and losing an enormous amount of fuel. It's crazy. So, 
if you go backwards in time and add 5 million tons per second to the sun, you start to create a problem at some point. I don't know what the number is, and I wouldn't give a number, because as soon as I give a number and say X number of million years ago this would have happened, the atheist or the skeptic will pick on the number and miss the concept. The fact is the sun is burning. If the sun were larger, it would begin to suck Mercury and Venus in, first of all, Mercury first, and then Venus, and then slowly affect Earth. Now, the Bulletin of American Astronomical Society in uh, 1979 said, since 1836, more than 100 direct observers, different observers at the Royal Greenwich Observatory and the U.S. Naval Observatory have made direct visual measurements that suggest the sun's diameter is shrinking at the rate of about a tenth of a percent each century which works out to be five feet per hour. Now, whether the number's right, I don't know. But the fact is, it's pretty obvious the sun is burning, and the sun, for 100 years of measurements, they said it's shrinking about five feet an hour. Of course, now the sun is gigantic, about 880,000 miles in diameter. So it's not a problem. We're not going to lose it anytime soon. Uh, Science Magazine ran an article in 1980 that said several indirect techniques also confirm the sun is shrinking, although these inferred collapse are only about one-seventh as much. By that thinking, the sun would have been touching the Earth 158 million years ago. And again, I don't, that's not my number. Somebody else uh, came up with that as a possible calculation, that the sun would have been touching the Earth. The fact is, the sun is shrinking. This chart shows the measurements of the not only the polar diameter, but the equatorial diameter. The sun has a uh, north and south pole like the Earth does. Both measurements are diminishing in the last 160 years. I mean, years. it only makes sense. It's burning it's fuel. It's been observed. The sun is shrinking. Now, the sun oscillates, it swells and shrinks and swells and shrinks, but the overall trend is quite obviously toward shrinking. The sun is burning. That creates a problem. If you go backwards in time, the sun would be bigger and more massive, which is going to upset the gravitational pull. So I don't think it's logical to say that Earth's been going around the sun for billions of years while the sun is constantly losing this mass and losing its gravitational pull. To me, that invokes a miracle much simpler to say, the system is not billions of years old like you're telling us. God created everything about 6,000 years ago, exactly like the Bible says. Okay, what about carbon dating? Every seminar I do, somebody will say, wait a minute, carbon dating proves the Earth is millions of years old. Oh, no, it doesn't. The fossils are actually dated by their position in the geologic column. We covered that in seminar part four. And the geologic column does not exist any place in the world. Radiometric dating would not even be possible if the geologic column had not been erected first. Article in Journal, uh, American Journal of Science Magazine. It was erected about through it. imagination. Ever since William Smith at the beginning of the 19th century, fossils have been and still are the best and most accurate method of dating and correlating the rocks in which they occur. Apart from very modern examples, which really are archaeology, this guy said, I can think of no cases of radioactive decay being used to date fossils. So they don't date fossils by carbon dating or potassium argon dating. This is a mammoth tooth. They date them by the geologic column. They pick a spot and say, wow, that era was you know, so many thousand years ago, and so this must be that old. Fossils are not dated by carbon dating. But let me explain how carbon dating works. The Earth's atmosphere is about 100 miles thick. On this globe, it doesn't even show up. I mean, it's the thickness of the, of the paint, basically. 100 miles is not much. The space shuttle whizzes around just above the atmosphere, so it cuts down on drag, and they can get no friction up there. Uh, still get lousy gas miles ago. The, um, Air, 100 miles thick, is mostly nitrogen, 78% uh, nitrogen, 21% oxygen, 0.06% carbon dioxide, and that's what plants breathe, CO2. Some people say 0.09 or 0.03, I don't know, it varies, I'm sure, location to location. But there's not a lot of CO2 in the air. If you increase CO2, plants grow faster, which is a frustration for the environmentalist wackos when they burn forests, you know, all the CO2 is released and the trees next door grow faster. So it doesn't uh, create an environmental crisis like they want you to believe. Uh, there's extremely small quantities of radioactive carbon-14. The way this works, uh, radiation from the sun strikes the atmosphere, super high-speed energy comes down, bangs into the nitrogen, and changes it to carbon-14. Just a quick, simple chemistry lesson here. Carbon and nitrogen are right next to each other on the periodic table. Nitrogen is number 14. Carbon is number 12. But if the nitrogen gets blasted by radiation, it turns into carbon-14. Normal carbon is called carbon-12. Here we have what's called radioactive carbon, carbon-14. It's very rare, um, and it doesn't stay stable because it's always breaking apart. You can hear it with a Geiger counter. You know, in the movies, they got the Geiger counter getting by the uranium going click, 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 click. 
Well, the same thing with carbon-14. It breaks apart. It's falling apart. And it's turning back into nitrogen and disappearing, which is a gas that disappears into the air. Um, carbon-14 is produced in the atmosphere by the sun. It breaks down at the rate of about half of it will break down every 5,730 years. This is called the half-life. So if I give you a pile of carbon-14, and you waited 5,730 years, half of it would turn back to nitrogen, and you'd end up with half a pile. If you wait another 5,700 years, half of that is going to turn to nitrogen. You end up with a fourth of a pile. In theory, it never goes to zero. It goes from half to fourth to eighth to sixteenth, etc. Plants are always breathing in carbon-14 in the photosynthesis process. They're breathing in carbon. Some of it's carbon-14. Most of it's normal carbon-12. Animals eat the plants and make it part of their body. Probably during your lifetime, you've either eaten plants or you've eaten animals that have eaten plants. That's about all there is to eat out there. And so you're absorbing radioactive carbon into you, just like I am into me, because we're getting it through the food chain. The plants got it from the air. The air got it from the sun. This carbon-14 got into the plants. Then it got into you or into the animals and then into you. But either way, we all contain some radioactive carbon. When the plant or animal dies, it's not going to get any more, obviously. So several assumptions are involved in carbon dating. First of all, they assume that the amount of C14 in the atmosphere, the ratio, which is a very small number, is the same found in the plants and animals. For instance, the atmosphere contains 0.000765% radioactive carbon-14. It is assumed that I have the same. I've never been tested for C14, and I've never met anybody who has. But I would say that's a reasonable assumption, but it is an assumption. Okay. When the plant or animal dies, it doesn't get any more C14, so whatever it had begins to decay. It was decaying while it was alive, but you never noticed it because it's being replenished, so the balance would stay. But as soon as it dies, it begins to go out of balance. So basically, carbon dating is measuring the amount of carbon in the object with the amount of carbon in the atmosphere and getting a balance. If the atmosphere is 0.000765% and the object you're dating is only half as much, they would assume it's been dead for one half-life. If it's only one-fourth as much, it's been dead for two half-lives, two times 5,730. And then it goes to a fourth, to an eighth, to a sixteenth. So they're comparing the amount in the object with the amount in the atmosphere. This is how carbon dating works. Sounds good. Certainly sounds scientific. But it's based on some serious assumptions that mess up everything. It doesn't work. If I told you to fill a barrel with water, but I have drill holes in the barrel, while you're putting water in, it begins to leak out. So you have a process of filling and a process of leaking at the same time. You have an adding and subtracting going on simultaneously. At some point, you're going to reach a stage called equilibrium. You'll never fill the barrel past that point unless you speed up the input or decrease the outgo one or the other. Well, Earth's atmosphere is constantly taking in carbon-14 from the sun and is constantly losing it to decay. So you have the same thing as the barrel. The question would be, how long would it take the Earth's atmosphere to reach equilibrium? Well, when carbon dating was first discovered or invented in the early 1950s or late 1940s, actually, really Libby did this at the University of Chicago, he said, you know, I wonder how long it would take the Earth's atmosphere to reach equilibrium, because he knew about the equilibrium problem. They said after some studies, it would take about 30,000 years. Basically, if you made a brand new planet Earth, poof, create one, covered with air, started spinning around itself and spinning around the sun, the sun is going to strike the oxygen, strike the atmosphere, produce carbon-14, and it's going to start decaying. And they said within 30,000 years, the atmosphere would be equalized. You'd reach this point called equilibrium. You're never going to get more C14, and you shouldn't get any less unless something changes in the system. Well, it sounds good. I don't know if the number's right, but it's a, the concept is, within 30,000 years, the Earth's atmosphere would reach equilibrium. The problem is, we still haven't reached equilibrium. There's more C14 now than there was 20 years ago. Actually, radiocarbon is forming 28 to 37% faster than its decay. So if we still haven't reached equilibrium, then the Earth is less than 30,000 years old. It also means your measurements are going to be screwed up. So you can't date anything. Uh, a friend of mine has a website, archie.org. You can get information. Because either more or less, depending on when it died, it's going to die with more or less carbon-14. So they're assuming a starting point based on the ratios in the atmosphere, but those ratios haven't stabilized. They're constantly changing. So depending on when the thing died, you'd have to adjust your formula. You can't, you can't date with that method. It won't work. 
you're missing factors you're trying to do math without um, some key components to your equation Care about the uh, Earth's atmosphere, atmosphere is still not reached equilibrium. equilibrium. There's, There's been a lot of people doing research on this, and it just we were not there yet. This chart indicates how carbon-14 is supposed to work in theory. And an, an object that is still alive should be in balance with the atmosphere, which would give you 16, I'm going to simplify this a little bit, give you 16 clicks per minute per gram on your Geiger counter. If you're listening to it, you know, dating is testing a sample to go click every four seconds, you know, click, click. If it's only giving you eight clicks per minute, then you're getting, you're assuming it's 5,700 years old. It's been through one half-life. If you're only getting four clicks per minute, it's been through two half-lives. If you're getting two clicks per minute, it's been through three half-lives. It's 11,000 years old. This is how carbon dating is done. If you test a sample and you find out you're getting, you know, two and a half clicks per minute or 2.9 or something like that, you look at the chart and read over and find the age by the simple calibration curve, they call it. Sounds good. Doesn't work. If you walked into a room and found a candle burning on a table, and I asked you the very simple question, when was it lit? I said, oh, I don't know, it was burning when I got here. Okay, let's do what's called empirical science, things we can test and demonstrate and weigh and prove, okay? We're going to measure the candle. We measure the height of the candle, we find out the candle is seven inches tall. Okay, when was it lit? You said, oh, I don't know. Okay, let's do some more science. Let's measure how fast it burns. Suppose we get an Olympic stopwatch and we measure this thing very carefully and find out the candle is burning one inch every hour. Now we've got two hard science empirical facts. The candle is seven inches tall. It is burning an inch an hour. When was it lit? You still can't tell me unless you make some assumptions. How tall was it? And has it always burned at the same rate? Neither of those assumptions can be proven. They are purely assumptions, okay? If you, if you find, find a fossil, fossil in the dirt, dirt all you know is it died. You don't even know where it died. You just know where it ended up buried, that's all. Now, the amount of carbon-14 could be measured very precisely, and the rate of, de of decay could be determined. But when did it live? I have no idea, and nobody does. Because you'd have to know how much was in it when it was alive, which that would depend on the assumption that the Earth's atmosphere has reached equilibrium, and we haven't. And you have to know that it's always decayed at the same rate. Now, if the Bible is right, and the Earth had a canopy of water overhead, like the Bible, I think, clearly teaches in 2 Peter 3 and in Genesis 1, 6, and 7, this canopy of water would filter out quite a bit of radiation, and they probably had a lot less carbon-14 in the original creation than we do today. So, if you dig up a fossil from an animal on the ground in the flood, and I don't know if any of these are or not, but if you find a fossil and say, well, I believe this one, this ammonite may have drowned in the flood. Probably did. And, and we, we want, want to find, 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 find out it's got carbon, it probably does, it's been totally replaced by minerals, but let's assume it, 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 it has an organic material. And so we carbon dated it. They would assume that it lived in an atmosphere that's just like we have today. Mm -hmm. Faulty assumption. Mm -hmm. Not a good idea. There's some examples of how carbon dating doesn't work. We'll go in chronological order here. Back in 1949, an article came out in Natural History magazine. It says the lower leg of a mammoth dated 15,000 years old, but the skin dated 21,000 years old. It didn't work in 1949. 1963, a living mollusk shell carbon dated at 2,300 years old. Well, here we are, 14 years later, carbon dating is still not working. Okay. Um, 1970, this article came out, and they said, if a carbon date supports our theories, we put it in the main text. If it is not entirely contradicted, we put it in a footnote. If it's completely out of date, we just drop it. 1971, a freshly killed seal carbon dated at 1,300 years old. Still not working, folks. Okay. 1975, a baby mammoth was found frozen. Part of it dated 40,000 years old. Another part was 26,000 years old. And the wood next to it is 9,000 years old. Still not working in 1975. 1981, they tried it again. This guy said, no matter how useful it is, the radiocarbon method is still not capable of yielding accurate and reliable results. There are gross discrepancies, the chronology is uneven and relative, and the accepted dates are actually selected dates. This whole blessed thing is nothing but 13th century alchemy. It all depends upon which funny paper you read. Still not working. 1984. Shells from living snails were carbon dated at 27,000 years old. Still not working. 1985. Took 11 human skeletons, the earliest known human remains in the Western Hemisphere, 
and they were carbon dated or dated by accelerator mass spectrometer, all 11 dated 5,000 radiocarbon years or less. Here are these things are supposed to be, you know, a quarter million years old or something. It's not working in 1985. 1992, two Colorado Creek mammoths, side by side, Buried frozen, frozen mammoths were dated. dated. One, one was 22,000 years old, the other is 16,000 years old. Still, Still not working in 92. In 1996, at uh, Berkeley University, they've got the Geochronology Center. Carl Swisher used the most advanced techniques to date human fossils. This article said last spring he was reevaluating Homo erectus skulls found in Java by testing the sediment found with them. A hominid species assumed to be an ancestor of Homo sapien, Erectus was thought to have vanished a quarter million years ago. Even though he used two different dating methods, Swisher kept making the same startling find. The bones were 53,000 at most and possibly no more than 27,000. Well, I would like to point out, Your Honor, that is a 96% error. So it's not working in 1996 either. Um, it's not logical to say carbon dating works. One part of a mammoth dated 29,000 years old, another part was 44,000 years old. This article said, in the last two years, an absolute date has been obtained for the Gandong beds. It has the very interesting value of 300,000 years, plus or minus 300,000 years. <laughs> so it doesn't work. We have in our library the Geological Survey Professional Paper 862. Some skeptics on the web have argued that you know, I didn't understand what the paper was saying. I think I do. It shows the charts here of the different carbon dates they got from different animals and different, you know, organic material found all over Alaska, the geological survey paper. Sample number 454, carbon dated at 17,210 years old. Sample 455 gave a carbon date of 24,000 years old. People say, see, what's the big deal? Well, look at it. This is the same sample as 454. 455 and 454 are the same creature. They're getting different ages. Sample 299 was dated at less than 20,000 years old. Sample 137X was dated at greater than 28,000. But read it carefully. That's the same sample as 299. They gave it a different number at a different laboratory, but it's the same sample. Two different numbers, same sample. Living penguins date 8,000 years old. Dinosaur material from dinosaur bone layers were found and dated at 34,000 years old. They find organic material with dinosaurs, sometimes frozen dinosaur bones, sometimes unfossilized dinosaur bones are found. Um, two Russian scientists dated dinosaur bones at less than 30,000 years old. Hugh Miller in Columbus, Ohio had four dinosaur bone samples carbon dated. They told him they were 20,000 years old. He didn't tell them they were dinosaur bones. If he would have said, this is a dinosaur bone, I want you to carbon date it, they would have said, oh, we can't date that because it's too old. So they start, this is a dinosaur bone, by the way. It's been replaced by minerals. They start with the assumption that dinosaurs lived 70 million years ago. If I took this to a laboratory and said, would you please date this? They would say, oh, well, we'd have to use something other than carbon dating because this is too old for carbon dating. They've already decided what range it fits in. That's not how science ought to work. You ought to be able to say, well, uh, let's just be open-minded about this. They can date the same sample 10 ways and get 10 different numbers. Okay. Here's the things to consider about carbon dating. If you date a sample of known age, I mean, you know how old it is, like the, uh, a tree ring. Carbon dating doesn't work. If you date a sample of unknown age, it's assumed to work. It's not science. That's not common sense. As elements decay, they produce helium. One of the byproducts of carbon decay or radioactive decay of any kind is it produces helium gas, which, you know, if, unless you're in the ground where it can be trapped in a cave, it's going to escape into the atmosphere. The helium in the atmosphere indicates the Earth is not billions of years old, actually less than two million years old, just based on the helium content in the atmosphere. If radioactive decay has been going on for millions of years, there should be a lot more helium. Taking all factors into account, the helium escape mechanisms and everything, it just, it, it's not more than two million years old. There's an excellent book if you want to get more in the go down deep stuff on carbon dating. You can get it through our bookstore if you want or call icr.org, they have the book there. This guy said, the rocks date the fossils, but the fossils date the rocks more accurately. So I'll tell you what, folks, the cheese done fell out of his sandwich, all right? He said, they use circu circularity is inherent in the derivation of time scales. They use circular reasoning. Uh, specimen uh, 10017 from the moon was dated six, divided into six pieces and dated many times. 
the ages range from 2.5 to 4.6 billion. Notice that's nearly a 500% error. It doesn't work. I talked to a J.P. Dawson in Oklahoma. He was the chief of engineering and operations for the Lunar and Earth Science Division at uh, NASA in Houston. He said they worked on the lunar samples, including the Genesis rock. He told me they found ages from 10,000 years to several billion years in the same rock. So basically, you can kind of pick what you want. There's an excellent chapter in this book uh, called Bones of Contention. The last chapter deals with what's called the dating game. It's hilarious to see how they change the dates uh, to make them fit. You know, if any new evidence comes in, we'll just change the date and make it fit the theory. All right, we'll take a little break here, come back and talk about the other dating methods, potassium, argon, some of the other ones, and then go on to more of your questions. All right, and we'll stop there. And okay, let's take a few more quick. Pick up next time. All right, so we got to start there on the Q&A with Dr. Ken Hoban, uh, part seven of his creation seminar series. And um, two very interesting questions, at least for me, two questions that um, I always thought early on in my faith would have caused um, the hardest objections to overcome. Like I, I thought carbon dating, um, just because I'm not a scientific person, so I don't understand all the science going into that. Um, he was mentioning that book that guy wrote about polonium halos and how the decay rate is like three minutes. So the fact that they exist in primordial rock shows that the rocks were formed instantaneously in under three minutes. That all sounds great, but I don't understand any of it. And uh, daughter atoms and parent atoms and things like that, I don't understand rates of decay. I don't understand... I'm glad for people like Dr. Ken Holman that explains some of these more complicated issues and simplistic matters. Also, um, I recommend the book The Collapse of Evolution by Scott Hughes, um, which also explains some of these things in really simple to grasp um, explanations as well. But um, so like to have an answer with the carbon dating that it simply doesn't work. I mean, all you need to know is if somebody brings up carbon dating is, A, they've dated living snails at 2,300 years old. They've dated penguins at 800 years old. They've gotten different dates from woolly mammoths and, and pieces of wood um, buried in the, in the same section. From the same woolly mammoth, they've gotten uh, thousands of years difference in dates. Um, the method doesn't work. Uh, the, the, the rate of decay is not proven to be constant and the, the amount of C14 in the atmosphere has not reached equilibrium. Um, so just knowing those things, you know that carbon dating can't work. It's not an effective method of dating things. It's, it doesn't work. So knowing that is very helpful. And then the starlight, that one um, later on in my faith, because um, I don't think I really thought about it until um, I read an article on it and I was like, hmm, I wonder what the answer is. And of course we have the scriptures where, like he pointed out numerous times, the Lord says he stretched out the heavens. And we know that God made things in full maturity. Adam and Eve were created in full maturity. They had food to eat in full maturity. Uh, you know, plants were growing, producing fruit. Um, so, like, that makes sense. Like, he, he it's, it's a, without even knowing anything more, you could say, well, the Lord obviously created that light already present and stretched out. So, like, we're receiving the light, you know, from those stars. But it, it, even though they're billions and billions of years away, um, it's not necessary to think that that light had to travel all the way here. That light started here and it's been stretched out. Um, so that made sense. And then some of the other things he talked about, like, uh, it's interesting to know that the speed of light is not constant that they've actually in the laboratory sped it up and, and slowed it down. So um, that shows that it's not a constant thing, that it, it, it can, in space, there could be factors. Uh, also, the measurements are, are impossible. They can't measure past 100 light years. Um, so it's impossible for them to say, oh, those are billions of light years away. There's no way of knowing that. The trigonometry doesn't work. The, that uh, forget what the, the method is called parallel something it it's just doesn't work um, so it's really really good to have simplistic answers like this that you can use if somebody brings stuff up like that and then you know if they're sincere and genuine in their questions they can go and do further research like I mentioned earlier answers in Genesis um, has numerous articles on starlight and uh, just super scientific the guys over there are, are geniuses I mean PhD level scientists who know what they're doing 
and wrote articles that are written on an intellectual academic level um, for other scientists um, you know far beyond my pay grade I couldn't understand it but uh, you also have ICR which he mentioned um, institution Institute of Creation Research uh, Dr. Henry Morris's um, foundation um, so if, if a person is genuinely sincere you you can offer up these simplistic explanations and then point them to these other ministries um, where if they really want to do the research they they can discover the answer um, the important thing from us for us from an, um, an apologetic standpoint is that these things help solidify our faith we're coming into this knowing the Bible is true it is absolute it is, it is indestructible and then you get some fiery darts thrown at you the devil comes with some clever schemes and arguments that that uh, if you're unprepared can rock you a little bit uh, but then you, you calm down and you go no the Bible's true we're just we're obviously missing some information here I don't have a full understanding and praise God that there's scientists uh, like Hoven and like AIG and like ICR that are putting in the footwork that are that are putting forth the effort to do things like this um, it just amazes me the amount of knowledge understanding and wisdom that God gives to people you know he puts passions on our hearts and drives us into specific areas of expertise and then just unloads information upon information like some of these things should not be understandable like how how could who figured out how to stop light like how did they ever figure out how to measure the speed of light that's just mind-boggling to me but the Lord has given people wisdom all to glorify his name to confirm his word science works with God to bring awe and and stunning reverence um, to the Lord you know our Creator God so um, anyways um, we'll, we'll continue on here next time Lord willing um, you know I get pretty tired doing these uh, hour-long ones um, but hopefully we can get through this in another two to three episodes and then uh, we'll wrap up the creation seminar series and move on to another DVD so um, as always I appreciate you guys watching with me and uh, we'll, we'll talk to you next time I love you